everybody and thank you for joining us for today's APMG webinar in partnership with Osaka. My name is Mark Constable, I'll be your host and moderator and today we're looking at some of the uh, latest IT governance trends and how the COVID framework and uh, CGEIT or CGIT certification can support professionals and businesses on their governance and um, compliance journeys. I'm delighted to be joined by our guest presenter Mark Thomas. Uh, now whilst two marks might get confusing you'll soon notice distinctly different accents which should help uh, help to avoid any confusion today. Uh, so a little, about, a little bit about Mr Thomas. Mark is a governance risk and compliance expert specialising in information assurance, IT strategy and service management with nearly 30 years of professional experience across a range of industries and sectors. Um, he's considered, considered one a, a thought leader in frameworks such as COVID, NIST, ITIL and multiple ISO standards, so you're in really good hands for today's session. Before I hand over to Mark T, bear with me a few more moments while I cover a little housekeeping. So the first point to note is we are recording the session today uh, and everyone that's registered will receive a follow up email uh, not too long after the webinar once we've got the recording and slides online. Uh, secondly, you can submit questions at any point. So on your go to webinar control panel, you should see an option where you can type in questions and they'll come through to me. I'll be keeping on our nose as we go and we'll address as many as we can towards the end. Uh, and last but not least, your feedback is uh, most welcome. So positive or negative, that really helps us when it comes to planning and delivering webinars in the future. Okay, that's all from me until we get to questions. So Mark, great to have you with us again and it's over to you, sir. Great, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for everybody for joining. This this is an exciting topic for me uh, because you know what's happening is, is you look at your Twitter feeds, you look at LinkedIn, you look at uh, articles out there, and and why is it that organizations wait until they hit the news before they suddenly have this newfound priority to somehow implement governance? Now, this is not an overnight project for you, nor are you ever really done implementing governance, right? It's an ongoing thing. So those are some of the things we'll talk about here coming up. But what do people do? They react. They send people to training. They say, get your C-Guide certification, go to COBIT uh, training. And, and, and somehow governance is supposed to magically appear at the organizations. But my suggestion to you after reviewing this webinar is to get on this now before you have a newsworthy event. Because putting governance practices in place can really help you look at those risks, can help you look at how you really govern and manage an enterprise. And of course, two of my favorite approaches in helping you put this together are the C-Guide certification and COBIT. I'll walk through the difference between both of those here throughout the next several slides. And there are a lot of connections between these things, and I'll show you what those are. So learning objectives very quickly. Again, we're talking about the link between C-Guide, which is certified in the governance of enterprise IT, one of what we call the core four at ISACA. And it happens to be one of my favorite certifications. And so what we'll talk about here, of course, is what is governance. We have to really understand this difference between governance and management, and of course, avoiding framework fatigue. You do not do a one and done when it comes to adopting uh, enterprise governance frameworks. So we'll talk about that with COBIT. Of course, how you get the knowledge, skills, and abilities. And then the last part that I really think you'll like is what's in it for me. Uh, so if you're if you are currently a C guide or if you're considering going down that path, what could COBIT actually do to help you out? There's a couple of perspectives here. One is again, C guide is framework agnostic, but do I think the COBIT framework will help you prepare for the exam? Sure, it will. But Will COBIT as a framework help you employ and deploy the practices and the tasks that the C-Guide designation suggests? Absolutely. So what you're going to have is an awesome download at the end of this webinar with tips and tricks and what I like to call my C-Guide and COBIT hacks. So here's our agenda. We're going to be talking about um, uh, governance framework fatigue. And you guys can kind of look through that. That's uh, uh, nothing surprising there. But let's Let's start with governance and, and why I believe IT should not be governing itself. Now, this is huge. If you take a look at this, this is this is what I experience in a lot of organizations. If you look over here on the left hand side, on the left hand, whoop, uh, skip slides. On the left hand slide side, you see a governing body that says, "Hey, we're the governing body. Why isn't IT following the rules?" And then over on the right hand side, you have IT sitting down here saying. 
we have no clue what the governing guidance is. There's, so there's always a disconnect when you when you look at communication, when you look at the different committees and boards and those types of things uh, that, that will govern an enterprise. So <clears throat> the reason I say IT should not govern itself is because of this. Number one, if you tell me in IT, I need to govern myself, what you've just told me is that I need to make up my own rules and I need to determine which of my own rules I choose to follow. And finally, I need to determine the consequences for those rules that I choose to break. Therefore, IT should not be governing itself. And so what is governance really all about? So when we look at kind of core concepts of enterprise governance of information and technology, you see EGIT here. Now you see a lot of different versions. You see enterprise governance of IT, you see governance of enterprise IT, which is part of the SEEK guide, and you see IT governance. For the purposes of this webinar, we're, gonna, we're going to assume they're really the same thing. But remember, no matter where you are in an organization, there will always be some type of governing body above you, and that governing body should be concerned with these areas. One is we need to make sure that our stakeholder needs are met through three things. Benefits realization, which says, are we doing what we said we'd do? Risk optimization says, are we making informed decisions? And resource optimizations, are we properly balancing the supply and demand of our resources? And that's not just people, there are several other areas here. So previously in, in our industry, governing boards and senior management, they could delegate, ignore, or even avoid IT related decisions, but because of the big push for digitized enterprises, it's increasingly dependent on information and technology for our survival and growth. So stakeholder value is driven by a high degree of digitization in these new business models, efficient processes, innovation, high velocity IT, and those types of things. So a couple other points I wanna make on governance before we jump into uh, some of our principles. Like we mentioned before, EGIT, GEIT, and IT governance for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to call it IT governance. But what this says is there's a distinction between the two, like I said before, when we say there's a distinction. Now, formally, we used to say there was a separation, but here's, here's, my, here's my advice to you. Wherever you are in an organization, know which governing bodies are guiding you. So as a CIO of a major organization, my governing bodies were the board of directors and the executive steering committee. But if I'm a project manager in an organization, who are my governing bodies? Because somebody has to set the rules, right? And identify those areas in which I'm supposed to manage myself within. So in those cases, the governing bodies for project manager could be say a project steering committee, project review board, those types of things. Another thing we'll talk about as we walk through this is the distinction between a governance system and a governance framework. And then, of course, like we said before, who are your governing bodies? Know the governing bodies that are setting the rules in which you need to manage yourself. And here's one of the things that I see in a lot of organizations is there are multiple governing bodies. You've got boards, committees, uh, and, and so on, and they, and they all set policy. But one of the things that we see is the policies and rules that each of those governing bodies set sometimes will contradict another one of those boards or committees. So suggestion to you, hey, make sure that you take a look at what those boards and committees are and what their charter statements are because that will be a big help for you. And we're jump, we're gonna jump into the C guidance and, uh, and COVID stuff specifically here in just a little bit. Now, a lot of people in high velocity environments say, well, there's no need for governance systems. Well, that is that can't be further from the truth because in a high velocity system where you may be doing agile or even some of the more uh, DevOps approaches, we still have a set of rules, but we're decentralizing some of the decision making, but I still want to make sure we have control over those systems. So therefore, let's talk about governance system principles. What you're looking here comes straight from COVID. So in a governance system, really, which is what C Guide is focused on, there are some principles that we need to be concerned with. One is stakeholder value, right? We need to make sure that that system satisfies our stakeholder needs, like we mentioned earlier. And we need to make sure that we're generating value from the use of and the investment in information and technology. We have to have a holistic approach. 
That governance system is built from a number of components. These are what we used to call enablers in earlier versions of COBIT. We'll show you that in a few minutes. We have to have a dynamic governance system, right? Which means that each time one or more of my factors change, for example, a change in strategy, technology, or threat environment, this could have an effect on my governance system. So gone are the days where we create a governance system and it stays the same for years because the environment's changing, our internal attributes are changing, cultures are changing, and we need to make sure that governance system supports that. As we mentioned earlier, governance is distinct from management and we tailor that to our enterprise needs, which, means, which basically means we're using these things called design factors. And I'll talk about those here just a little bit. Finally, end-to-end -end governance system, we should cover the enterprise end-to-end, -end, which means there should be something in this for everybody. I'm going to prove that to you in the next several slides. All right, so we've talked about governance. And again, you can find out more information on governance. There are several webinars and white papers out on the ASACA and APMG sites for you on that. So let's talk about frameworks. <laughs> I know I can't see you, but raise your hand if you are suffering from framework overload i've been talking about this for years because everybody has a framework that's going to save this organization so when we pick a framework right and multiple frameworks you've got cobit you've got itil you've got togap you've got multiple iso standards nist and so on some things to think about so a few minutes ago we talked about system principles these are principles around a framework so it needs to be based on a conceptual model, of course, uh, identifying the key components, the relationships among those components to make sure we're maximizing our consistency and we're allowing for automation. A framework should be open and flexible, which basically means it should allow the addition of new content, the ability to address new issues. For example, one of the things we'll talk about in COVID is it's not just by itself. COVID says, hey, there are other frameworks we have to have in place in order for us to be successful. And of course, that drives us to align with major standards and those standards could be also frameworks, bodies of knowledge, and so on. So my, my, my advice here is don't do the one and done. Now you're probably in your head thinking, well, what's the difference between C Guide and COVID then? I'll cover that for you here in just a few minutes. But what I really, really like to do is say, look, there are a lot of different frameworks out there. Many of you have probably seen this slide. This is a signature slide that I love to discuss. Um, and by the way, what you're looking at right here, see Guide covers this entire slide, but Cobit is a framework that enables and allows me to implement those tasks and activities. So at the enterprise level, we're of course looked at, looking at the balance between performance and conformance. On the performance side, we're looking at the balanced scorecard and per conformance, an example would be COSO. But skip this piece in the middle that says enterprise IT governance or IT governance, because most people miss that section and they go right to the bottom and they say, ITIL's it for us, ISO's it, NIST, any others, and they, they are missing this vital link between the highest governing body of the enterprise and how we govern and manage our frameworks. And that, folks, is where COBIT really, really fits the mark for us. So I wanna put that into perspective for you before we start jumping into how this whole COBIT framework and C Guide actually work together. This might be you. I have no idea. I've got an option here. I need to either pick C Guide or COBIT or go with both. Let's tell you a little bit about the C Guide designation. This is a professional designation. You see on the cover slide of this uh, of this presentation, it said Mark Thomas. One of the designations was C Guide, Certified in Governance for Enterprise IT. It helps you understand how you manage, how you govern enterprise governance, and it prepares you for governance or management roles in the enterprise. And one of the things that I see is people say, well, see, guy, that's a governance related type of uh, designation. Well, I will tell you, just like COVID, there is something in C guide for everyone. Don't just think this is focused on a board level. It's for anybody, whether you're management, whether you are individual contributor, there's something in this for you. And I want you to be aware of that because 
folks, I will tell you, and I mentioned this before, Seed Guide is one of my favorite certifications that I hold today. Now, let's contrast that with COBIT. Well, COBIT is a framework where Seed Guide is a professional designation. COBIT is a framework that now helps me adopt and adapt these governance and management objectives. It helps me put things in place. It can also assist you in preparing for the Seed Guide exam. Please don't walk out of this webinar thinking that if you know COBIT end to end, you'll pass the Seed Guide exam. I'm not saying that. I'm saying Seed Guide as a professional designation, many of the things that we have in that are supported by COBIT. I've got a mapping for you in the next several slides to show you my perception of how that mapping comes together. So let's take a look at the difference between these things. Of course, certified the governance of enterprise IT over on the left-hand side. It is framework agnostic, even though I'm trying to influence you to think about COBIT, it is agnostic. There are multiple framework standards, body of some knowledge that were used uh, to help us create uh, the tasks, knowledge statements and the domains for Seek Guide, as well as COBIT. Now it's a professional designation. It addresses multiple roles in the enterprise. This is what I wanted to tell you earlier is you do not have to be a, uh, a board director or a board member for C Guide to be uh, valuable for you. It doesn't matter where you are. You can apply this to the ecosystem in which you work. Now C Guide is broken out into what we call domains, tasks, and knowledge statements. And I'll share those with you in, in the next slide. So it's a designation on the left. On the right, we said that's a framework. Framework for the governance and management of enterprise information and technology. COVID-2019 is the latest and the greatest uh, framework uh, for this. Uh, to my knowledge and my professional ability, I can tell you this is the only framework that does this in our industry today. Now, the difference here is it's certificate based, which basically means you don't have to keep CPE, CPU, PDU, right? Once you get your COVID designation, it's a certificate course for you. It really focuses on this distinction between governance and management that I mentioned earlier. Some key points here is it has, of course, uh, components and design factors. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. And one of my favorite parts is the adoption of what we call governance and management objectives. Now, the intent of this webinar is to not teach you COBIT or teach you SIGGITE, is to show you the connections between the two. So let's start with SIGGITE. So SIGGITE is broken up into what we call work-related domains. Now, some folks refer to these as job practice areas. So there are five domains in SIGGITE. You notice on the first one, it says, we have the framework for the governance and management of enterprise IT. This is important, each one of these domains, because I'm going to link certain COBIT aspects for you here in just a few minutes. Now, notice here on the right-hand side, it says under that first domain, we have 11 task statements and 14 knowledge statements. A task statement is a statement of a highly specific action. It always has, say, a verb and an object, something I have to accomplish. A knowledge statement is a specific skill or ability that you might have in your toolbox that might be required to accomplish those tasks. So therefore, we have the framework for the governance and management of enterprise IT. That's a good one, right? So that basically says we have to have boards, uh, we have to have uh, we have to have governing bodies um, and frameworks in in order for us to govern and manage IT. Strategic management. We need to ensure that IT is, in, is enabling and supporting the achievement of my enterprise's objectives through the integration and alignment of my strategic plans. Next, we have benefits realization, making sure that IT-enabled investments are managed to deliver optimized business benefits. Is it doing what we said it would do? Risk optimization making sure that we have a risk management framework that it exists. We can identify, analyze, mitigate, manage, and monitor, as well as communicate our IT-related business risks in our overall enterprise risk management framework. And finally, resource optimization, making sure that we are optimizing the resources, and we're talking demand and supply here. And this includes information, services, infrastructure, applications, people, anything that's required to support the achievement of my enterprise 
objective. So that is the high level look at C guy. Let's take a look at COVID. Um, you guys know I could be on this slide all day long, but let me tell you some of the key parts of the of COVID 2019. Of course, we have system and framework principles. We covered those a few minutes ago. We have what are called governance components. I love these. These are what we used to call enablers in uh, in COVID-5. These are things like processes, organizational structures, uh, information flows and items, people, skills and competencies, principles, policies, procedures, culture, ethics and behavior, and of course, services, infrastructure and applications. We have focus areas and design factors. Guys, you can find a huge amount of information out on the APM GNI Psyche sites about focus areas and design factors, but the governance and management objectives are awesome. I'll show you that on the next slide. We have performance management, implementation, business case, and one of my favorites, the goals cascade. So I don't mean to skip over COVID so quickly, but I think it's important for us to understand a couple of things here. One is what we call the governance components and one is what we call governance and management objectives. Let's take a look at what these things look like. On this slide, this is my slide that I use to replace what I call the box of boxes. This is the COBIT core. What you're looking at here are 40 objectives that every organization, IT related organization meets. You may meet them at varying levels of maturity or capability. If you are looking in the COVID documentation, you might recognize this as the box of boxes. It's a big blue screen with a bunch of white boxes in it that has this distinction between governance objectives that you see on the left-hand side. Those are EDM01 through EDM05. Now, those are objectives that a governing body should meet. That does not mean you have to be the board of directors. It means if you are a governing body, those are the things, the objectives you need to meet. To the right, we have management objectives. I want you to make a note to earmark this slide. Why is that? Because you're going to get these slides afterwards. And in my COBIT and, and CGOT hacks that I'm going to share with you as a download, I will refer to these governance or management objectives. So this is a great uh, reference point for you to go back and say, what was BAI05 again? You can come back here and see that. Each one of these governance or management objectives obviously are broken down into every one of the components that I mentioned earlier. They're broken down <clears throat> by process uh, with organizational structures and a RACI chart, uh, information inputs and outputs, and those types of things. So again, I'm not trying to put you through a COVID class, but I need you to be aware of this before we jump into the next section that starts talking about the alignment between each one of these areas. Okay, remember we said earlier, we have five domains in C Guide. What you're looking at here is domain number one. What I did for you guys is this, is I took every one of the domains and I went through every one of those tasks and knowledge statements. And then I determined which parts of COVID were the most applicable for that domain. So what does this do for you? Well, a couple of things. One is if you are C Guide and you are trying to adopt and adapt uh, an enterprise IT governance system, you can break this down by domain. And what I've done is said, here's where you look in COBIT to help you out. The second thing it could do for you is that, let's say you're taking a C Guide um, uh, certified exam. Will these parts of COBIT help you? They will help you, but remember, they're not going to answer every specific question for you. It's the framework that supports that. So in domain number one, I have to have a framework in place. And, and so we talk about that framework, of course, the parts of COBIT that are relevant here, all governance system and framework principles that we talked about earlier, the design factors and focus areas, but here is what is awesome for you. Here are the example governance and management objectives that I feel are the most appropriate for this domain. Now, what you're looking at here, these, uh, these alphanumeric uh, numbers with names, these come from the previous slide that I showed you that has the list of the 40 governance management objectives. So in domain number one, which of the objectives seem to be the most appropriate based on my analysis, EDM01, ensured governance framework setting and maintenance, which really looks at a very high level of how the organization provides a consistent approach that's integrated and aligned with enterprise governance. Next, you see APO01, Manage the IT Framework. 
it is kind of similar to EDM01, but it's more management focused than it is governance focused. So it's making sure that we have a consistent management approach for the enterprise governance requirements to be met. APO2, managed strategy. This is supporting the digital transformation strategy of the organization and deliver the desired value through a roadmap of incremental changes. A huge one, APO3, managed enterprise architecture represents the different building blocks that make up the enterprise and its interrelationships, as well as the principles guiding their design and evolution over time. And finally, you see down there, MEA03, managed compliance with external requirements, which basically says ensuring that we are compliant with all applicable external requirements out there. Could there be more relevant uh, uh, governance or management objectives? Of course, I picked the ones that to me, in my professional opinion, had the most oomph that could help you out on this side. So of course, all governance components that we've talked about, and each one of those governance components within COVID talks about relevant industry frameworks. Not surprisingly, those industry frameworks in COVID look and smell just like the industry frameworks that we see in the C Guide course. Of course, I think it's important for you to look at the relevant RACI chart roles. One change that we had with the RACI chart in COVID 2019 is still RACI, but we only provide responsible and accountable guidance where we say the consultant and informed guidance you figure out at your organization based on your culture and your organizational structures. So that's domain number one. Domain number two, strategic management, right? So of course, all governance system and, and framework principles and all the design factors. I did point out a couple of design factors that I think are important for you. One would be what's called enterprise strategy and one is called enterprise goals. And that refers to the goals cascade. Folks, if you don't know what I'm talking about on that, go out to the ISOC and APMG sites. There are several uh, webinars, white papers and references to the design factors <clears throat> and a lot of good stuff out on LinkedIn, YouTube and those kinds of things as well. But for strategic management, a couple of the areas that I thought were most important for us from a, uh, from a governance and management perspective, EDM05, which is ensure stakeholder engagement. This is a pretty big one because we need to make sure that stakeholders are supportive of the information and technology strategy in my roadmap. Uh, communication to straight stakeholders is effective and timely. And the basis of reporting is established to increase my performance performance, EDM05. APO2, managed strategy, we saw that one a little bit earlier. We saw that yesterday, uh, on, the, on the previous slide. Managed strategy says, hey, are we supporting the digital transformation strategy or uh, the strategy that the organization is going down? We saw APO3, managed enterprise architecture. And, and a lot of what we see in APO3 uh, it, uh, comes from or is referenced in the TOGAF uh, framework, also known as the Open Group Architecture Framework, also mentioned in the CGOT content. But here's one that's new to you, MEA01, that's Monitor, Evaluate, and Assess 01. We provide transparency of performance and conformance in order to achieve our goals. Because remember, when we're talking about strategic management, you guys know you cannot be fully 100% compliant to every rule out there because if you are you may not be able to perform as an organization many of you have heard me told tell the story of my ceo who slapped his hand on the table and he said why are we losing business as the most secured company in the world well what was happening was we were so overly compliant when it came to security that we couldn't perform as an enterprise of course, all governance components, relevant RACI charts. And one of the areas that I thought was really, really important here was in COBIT, we have what are called information flows and items, and those are inputs and outputs at the practice level. I think it would be important for you for this domain to understand those inputs and outputs because it would truly help you understand strategic management, all of the requirements and um, all of the inputs required in order for this domain to be successful for you. One of my favorites here, well, they're all my favorite, but uh, domain number three, benefits realization. Benefits realization says, hey, are we 
when we invest in information and technology, do we have a business case? And are we managing that business case throughout the complete life cycle of that investment? So of course, all the design factors are very important for us, particularly enterprise goals, because what are we trying to do? We're trying to invest in INT that helps us meet enterprise goals. You can find that in the goals cascade, as well as a design factor enterprise goals. But here's the meat. Here are the example governance and management objectives that I believe are the most appropriate for you. Now, this is huge. You look at, you look at this first one, EDM02. There's a process for this domain or objective for this domain in COVID, ensured benefits delivery. And what it says is, is we are securing optimal value from our information and technology enabled initiatives, our services and assets. We have cost efficient delivery of our solutions and our services and reliable and accurate picture of the costs and the expected benefits so that the business needs are supported. So that's a big one. Think about that as a very high level governance area uh, objective. But that then really goes down to the next one, APO5 managed portfolio. Because what managed portfolio is saying is we're optimizing the performance of the portfolio of my programs which takes us to BAI 01, which is my programs. It says, hey, I'm realizing desired business value and reducing the risk of, say, unexpected delays, costs, or even value erosion. And a lot of stuff you see in programs and projects, you know, a lot of different um, uh, frameworks out there. Primarily, you see a lot uh, from uh, the PMBOK uh, and those types of things. But remember, a pro program is a collection of projects which takes me down to BAI 11, which is realizing defined project outcomes and reducing the risk of unexpected delays. So if you're looking at domain number three, what areas of COBIT do I feel are the most applicable? Those four areas are the most applicable. Of course, there are several others, but of course we only have an hour uh, for me to uh, share some of this knowledge to, with you. So I think those are the key ones out there for you. Of course, like we mentioned before, all the governance components and the frameworks for each one of those objectives are referenced in COBIT, the RACI chart, and of course, the goals cascade, like we said before, uh, up above. The goals cascade is what I say is one of the best kept secrets in our industry today, because it now helps me look at how I'm investing and what benefits need to be in place in order for the enterprise to meet its goals. And again, enterprises goals can change on a regular basis and that may depend on uh, be dependent on uh, things taking place in the market uh, that might be uh, actions of our competitors uh, social trends those types of things as well and you also see COVID performance management we won't go into that into a lot of depth in this course uh, in this uh, webinar but this is really one of the cool things out there that that we've got available to us is the CMMI and that allows us to now have a repeatable way to measure the maturity and the capability of each one of our uh, objectives out there. So that's domain number three, which takes us to a very interesting domain called domain four, which is risk optimization. Risk optimization, some of you may um, already have uh, the certification, say C-Risk, for example. The way I see this is domain four, risk optimization, is a uh, is a, 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 a smaller view of the entire C-Risk designation. But remember, we're talking about enterprise governance. Risk is a critical component of this. So, of course, all governance system framework and principles, the design factors, I believe, are the most important for you, our risk profile which are basically your um, uh, risk scenarios, and you can find those in COBIT. Your INT-related issues, which we formerly called pain points, and uh, those are issues that uh, once might have been risks, but they've been realized. Threat landscape and my compliance requirements. Check out the objectives that I think are important for this domain. First, first one is EDM03. Remember EDM, evaluate, direct, and monitor. That's one of my governance domains. And this is ensured risk optimization, making sure that enterprise risk or that INT related risk does not exceed the enterprise's risk appetite and tolerance levels. Appetite says, hey, what's the level of risk we're willing to accept to achieve our goals? And the risk tolerance says, 
is there some wiggle room? What's the acceptable level of deviation under certain circumstances? A couple others I think are very important. It's, of course, APO 10. You can't you can't um, uh, read about a newsworthy hack without somebody saying, "Oh, there was a vendor involved." But I will tell you this: in APO 10, is don't believe that. Uh, vendors are all violating the the contract that you have. Where most of your risk is in APO 10, I believe, is that organizations will 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 execute a contract with that vendor that is not optimal for me. The vendors are doing exactly what we put what we contracted them to do. We just put them under the wrong contract. But we obviously need to make sure that we're optimizing our capabilities uh, to support the strategy and looking at the risk associated with non-performing uh, vendors. But your biggest risk in there is the tendering process in uh, in vendor management. Of course, APO 12 managed risk. This is a huge, huge objective for us because we're integrating the management of INT related enterprise risk with the overall ERM strategy, which would be up in EDM03. Another one, couple of course, managed security, APO13, making sure that we're keeping the impact and occurrence of security incidents within the appetite levels. And a new one to COVID-2019, managed data. You can imagine where this came from. Of course, the uh, the increased visibility to uh, privacy and understanding where our data is and how we're using that. So making sure that we're us utilizing critical data acts, uh, assets to achieve our goals and objectives. Of course, all components and the relevant RACI chart roles. So that, folks, is domain number four, risk optimization. You might remember in C Guide today, we have five domains. That takes me to the last domain coming up, and that's resource optimization. <laughs> now, if I asked any of you, if I said, hey, folks, I'm going to give you 30 additional full-time equivalents, right, FTEs, how many of you would say, eh, no thanks, we're good on people, <laughs> right? Nobody says that. But this is what we're trying to do is, is we're really trying to look at the assets that we have in place because remember resources are not just people they include infrastructure applications information finance may be a part of that and those types of things so what we're trying to do is really look at how we balance that supply and demand and this is really one of the pushes uh, towards uh, towards high velocity IT because now we need things faster and we need them uh, we need them higher quality. So therefore, I need to look at how we're optimizing my, our resources to be able to support that. Of course, all of my system and framework principles, design factors. We mentioned that earlier. Particularly, what I think you look at is role of IT, sourcing model for IT, implementation methods, and of course the adoption strategy we have. More information on that you can find um, out on uh, APMG's and uh, ISACA sites. But here's the meat. What are the objectives I feel are most applicable for domain number five, resource optimization, uh, insured resource optimization, EDM04. You might recognize EDM, evaluate, direct, and monitor one of my governance objectives. What this says is I'm ensuring that all resource needs of the enterprise are met in an optimal manner. I'm, I'm optimizing costs. There's an increase, uh, increased likelihood of benefit realization, so it links to some of the other processes. Of course, AP06, manage budget and cost. Where's my money going? Where do I plan on spending that money? And how am I getting charged back? Or how am I charging or getting uh, compensated for those? AP07, managed human resources. Of course, what we're looking at there is optimizing our resource capabilities to meet the enterprise objectives. And this one's huge. A lot of people miss AP09. Because when I'm looking at resource optimization, when we have managed service agreements, a lot of people think, okay, but then COVID, it basically says have a services catalog, um, have uh, SLAs in place. But I will tell you, this is absolutely insane. Why is that? Because if you look at a service level agreement, we're ensuring that my service levels meet the enterprise needs. But in order for those service agreements to be met, I have to have resources in place. And by the way, some of those resources might come in the form of APO10 managed vendors. And that goes back to that vendor piece on, on that one as well. But 
but I will say this is, is I can actually link APO9 back to uh, the previous domain, which was re, uh, risk optimization. Uh, and I will tell you this is, is my organization that I was a part of, I mean, we were solid security wise, but where our biggest risks were, were service agreements. We were failing to meet our contractual obligations as a part of service agreements with our clients. And we were going out of business because of that. And nobody ever thought that managed service agreements was a huge, huge practice, excuse me, uh, objective in resource optimization. So anyway, hopefully that's helped you guys out kind of understanding what I've just done is walk through the five C guide domains and given you my professional opinion on what parts of COVID are relevant to that. And remember, it can help you in two ways. Number one is if you are adopting a governance a uh, system in your enterprise, this tells you how you can put this designation called C-Guide, and you can really overlap that with a framework called COBIT and help you adopt those practices, as well as if you understand those things within COBIT, it certainly can help you on the C-Guide exam. Again, that's not the point, but it can certainly, it certainly would not hurt. Now, what's in all this stuff for me? I mean, throwing a whole bunch of information out to you about C God and C risk, and, and a lot of people say, "Hey, look, they seem to focus on areas that aren't applicable applicable to me." Well, is is there anything in here relevant to my role? I'm not a board member. I'm a project manager. I'm an individual contributor. I'm a security analyst. Well, the good news, folks, is there's something in both C Guide and CoBit for everybody. Do not think these are just a reserve for the board. Remember, wherever you are in an organization, there's always a governing body above you, and likely you sit on one of those boards. Have you ever been to a change advisory board or a change control meeting? A lot of people on this call have. That is a governing body. So you need to make sure that there's this distinction between how you govern and how you manage. So the first thing I want to do is share a little bit of information uh, with you on, on certification, right? What's in this for me, right? If I get certified in C Guide, right, what would I do if I were you? Of course, it's enhanced knowledge and governance and management of enterprise IT. You can see some of the basic bullet points uh, I have here. A lot of certification holders, again, like I mentioned, one of my personal favorites. But what would I do to prepare for this exam or certification if I were you? Right, you prepare. Of course, you can go to a C Guide course. Um, ISACA has some really cool, what we call virtual instructor led training courses or built courses. Uh, they are abbreviated boot camps. Um, I would definitely download the publications and even the exam sample exam questions um, and get the exam candidate guide that will help you out. You take the exam, you register and pay. There's 150 multiple choice questions, it's based on a 200 point scale. Uh, 200, the lowest possible, and 800 uh, means you got all of them correct. How they are identified and how they're scored, I don't have that information for you. But once you take the exam, then you apply for CGUIDE certification where you have to identify uh, work experience and turn the application in. Uh, once you are awarded CGUIDE, you have to maintain continuing education credits. And of course, like I said, folks, there are enhanced salary ranges based on several studies that I've seen uh, out in our industry. And that's not the only reason you do this, but it really gives you an edge at understanding how to distinct governance, how to have distinction between governance and management. Next, COVID. So of course, what we want to do, it can assist you in the C-Guide exam as well as helping you adopt a lot of the concepts. Uh, the training or the uh, the courses available, you can do a COVID foundation, uh, design and implementation course, uh, implementing the NIST cybersecurity framework using COBIT. And then, of course, if you are a current COBIT 5 certification or uh, certificate holder, you could also take the COBIT bridge course. And if you are a COBIT 5 person, I would highly suggest you do the, the bridge exam. If you're not comfortable, go through the full course and do it that way. As we mentioned, the C-Guide, you prepare for the exam uh, through courses or the VILTs that I mentioned before. The exam, you, uh, you purchase that directly on the Osaka site, um, and it's a closed book, 75 question, multiple choice exam. You have 120 minutes, 65% or higher 
will get you a pass on that. And they are online proctored with COVID because it is not a designation. You do not need to keep or maintain CPE because it is a certificate. All right, so let's continue on the what's in it for me. Some of the really, really cool things I wanted to share with you guys. And what you see here, these are, I, I dive into these very, very deeply in my COBIT and C Guide hacks that will be part of your download coming up. But if you look at the top darker blue roles, these are general roles, board, uh, middle management, and analysts, right? And so you're going to see that there are very high level, some, uh, some advice here. But I wanted to really jump down into more specific roles um, that people ask me about. I have project management. I have risk compliance professionals, information security course. There are several that say, hey, what's in these for me? And that's what I'm going to dive deep in the COVID hacks that, uh, that are available for you for download after this. But let me give you a sneak peek of these things. If you're looking at this chart, what you'll see, these are the generic roles that I had in the previous slide. Board all the way down through middle management and an analyst. So I have under C, guide and COBIT on top. And what I've identified is, hey, number one, what's in it for me? And number two, where do you look? Let's start with C, guide for example, board and executive management. What's in it for me? If I'm a board member, it gives me a holistic understanding of how all these domains relate to governing enterprise IT. All the way down to an individual contributor. It can tell me, see, guy, it says, here are the specific tasks and the knowledge areas, remember those, that are applicable to any specific role and domain. So it's very high level for these generic roles. All domains in CGOT answer these. Folks, I couldn't find any specific areas for those three roles that I would suggest other than understanding all the domains. Of course, in COVID, if I'm a board member, it gives me insights on how to gain value from IT, how I monitor their performance, where do you there? principles, design factors, objectives, and EDM domain in the COBIT hacks uh, and CGI hacks, I have specific areas that I think you should look. So that gives you kind of a high level look at what's in it for me from a generic roles perspective. And again, you'll have this information for you. Now we get into a little bit more detail. These are the specific roles. Let's say you're a project manager, program manager. When you're looking at CGI, what's in it for me? This helps you understand how programs and projects fit into the overall strategic plans. Where do you look? Domains three, four, and five. Now we're getting some specifics. For COBIT, helps me understand how to manage programs and projects in alignment with my strategy. And look at those numbers on the right. Hopefully you earmarked a slide a few slides ago that I called the COBIT core, which said, here are the governance and management objectives. And these are the ones that I will tell you as a project manager, are the most applicable and appropriate for you. In order for you to navigate each one of those, of course, you'll go into what we call the governance and management objectives guide. It has practices, activities, um, and racy charts. It's broken down by each one of my governance components. If you're in the risk compliance area, what does CGUIDE do for you? Helps me identify, assess, respond to, and monitor and report on risks. And those might be specific to my compliance related risks. Where do you look? Domains one and four. What's in it for me with COBIT? Understanding the enterprise risk and how we are balancing that with the enterprise risk appetite and tolerance levels. Of course, there are my governance and management objectives that I suggest based on my knowledge of both of these areas that I think you should look. Finally, information security. From a CGI perspective, relate the enterprise security posture to my overall appetite and tolerance levels. In C guide, go to domains two and three. And here's where you go in COBIT. So hopefully that was helpful for you. And it gave you some good information to, to at least understand what's in it for me. Now remember, like we said before, that uh, I'm due, I will provide what I call my COBIT and C guide hacks um, as a part of this. So what we have is I have 10 C guide and COBIT tips or hacks, and these are based on the most common questions and concerns that I receive as a professional in the governance and management space. And what I do on these hacks is provide you information on where you go in CGI and where you go in COBIT and specifically uh, what tasks and activities or even the practices and activities that you go for each one of those. And again, that document uh, will be available for you for download uh, after, after this course. It will come to you um, via email. Here are my hacks. 
So you notice the first six are Wiffums. What's in it for me? We saw these before. Now I gave you in this presentation deck a very high level view of what's in it for me for the top three. Those were general roles, board executive management, middle management, and an analyst individual contributor. I go into a little bit more depth uh, on this download for you. But then it gets really deep. I take three specific roles, program project management, risk compliance, and information security. And I tell you specifically, if I were you, where I would go in Seaguide and where I would go in COBIT to help you create value for the enterprise. The remaining four are pretty common questions I receive. Hey, uh, using COBIT as a means of adopting a tailorable governance framework in your organization. Remember, the Seaguide is the designation that teaches me the knowledge, skills, and abilities. COBIT is the framework. So I've got some information in there on where I think you look in both of these areas to help you make a tailorable governance framework. Now, one of the things I do like a lot about the latest version of COBIT is that it is tailorable. And you might make a little note here that this, you can find a lot of information here from what's called the design guide. Remember we said we have design factors, which range everywhere from enterprise strategy to threat landscape to enterprise size. And if any of these factors change, I can tailor my governance framework, therefore, my governance system, right, to basically respond to changes in the market and those types of things. Number eight says adopting GEIT, governance of enterprise IT, in an environment that has little to no executive support. I get this one all the time. People say, you know what, I read C Guide, I read COBIT, and it, it kind of sounds to me like I have to have the board and executives involved, but I don't have executive level support, so it won't do me any good. Wrong answer. Folks, if you don't have executive level support for this, what you do, is you take the ecosystem in which you operate, consider yourself the CEO of that ecosystem, and you apply these models in the areas that you can directly influence. And you will see over time, it starts to work its way out of your organization and other people and other functions start to do the same thing. Don't think because you don't have executive level support, this is useless to you. It's actually a huge asset for you to focus on. Next, making GEIT sustainable and continuous. Uh, remember, adopting IT governance is not one and done. You will never be finished adopting enterprise IT governance. Do not wait until your next newsworthy event before you finally decide to adopt this. Uh, a lot of models exist out there. One in particular uh, within COBIT we have is the, uh, the implementation uh, guide. Even though I like to call it adoption, it's a continuous approach. And I think you'll like uh, some of the suggestions I give you there. And then finally, number 10, tips and tricks to studying for CGUI and COVID exams. I give you some really, really good tips on how you might want to focus your time and effort um, on studying for either or both of those exams. Okay, like we said before, those tips and those hacks are available for you as download following this webinar. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know I have basically given you a master's level course in uh, in about 50 minutes. <laughs> and I usually get a lot of questions out there. So what I'd like to do is open it up. Mark, if you don't mind jumping in, maybe we got a couple questions out there that I might be able to help some of our listeners with. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. Great stuff. Um, yeah, got a, a few questions to kick off with. Um, we, we've got five or six minutes left, haven't we? So we'll see, sure. see what we can get through. Um, so CG, CG IT versus COBIT, what is the, um, it's got TCO, so I think that's total investment, achieving the certification versus maintaining the certification. Is that something you can answer for us? Oh, so so uh, so I think what I heard was, hey, is there, you know, what's the value proposition of, of doing this versus the CPE? What I would tell you is this: is a lot of organizations do not require a C guide or a a, a COBIT um, certification um, for management that worked under my organization. Um, I would highly encourage the C guide. Um, um, designation. And if I'm going to encourage that, I will also help you financially with maintaining CPE. But I will say this is, is for example, uh, this webinar that we're on today, you get a CPE for being in this webinar. 
Um, ISACA does provide a large number of webinars that are available to you that are not things that you have to pay for that uh, you can maintain your CPE. But I would tell you this is one of the things that's, that that I believe is is the most valuable is in order for me to maintain my CPE, I now uh, I consider going to different conferences and to seminars, uh, to local chapter meetings. So it, and I, say, I hate to say it forces me, but it encourages me to to stay um, to stay engaged in my uh, in my craft, so that I'm constantly updating uh, my skills and abilities while um, gaining CPE, valuable CPE for that. So I would tell you that um, for me specifically, and I'm you know again I'm a consultant and trainer today, but even as a CIO and professional, I found that the cost benefit analysis that the benefits far outweighed the cost because it allowed me to stay on top of what's going on with the latest trends out there. Cool, thanks for that. Um, participants ask, can one pass the CGUI exam by just studying available materials? So I guess that's his, um, his, his training mandatory in other words, I guess. Yeah, you can. Um, and so, you know, when 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 these designations came out, like CGUI, there was a grandfathering that came out, but this is several years ago. Um, it depends. On, it depends on your learning style. Um, there are some folks who um, who can completely uh, read the uh, CGUI publication um, and uh, and go through the uh, sample exam questions and have absolutely no problem with the with the exam. Um, but some folks learn differently. And the way I always really say it is, hey, I want you to understand this as opposed to just memorizing it. So if you understand it, a lot of times with the with the courses that you may go through, if you get an instructor that will share stories with you and link certain concepts uh, of C Guide with the specific uh, learning objectives, it helps you understand. So you can actually apply and relate that to things that you do today. So the short answer is, can you pass the exam without going through a course? Absolutely. Uh, what would I do if I were you? Of course, that depends on your financial means. I would definitely go through one of the uh, preparation courses um, and do your vetting on on who's teaching the course for you. And and the you know because there are a lot of organizations that we see that are not accredited uh, organizations or accredited trainers, which is which is one of the things APMG helps us do is accredit trainers, so you know you are getting. Uh, uh, a trainer who understands the content and can link it to you. So you can pass it without, but I would suggest going to some type of uh, a preparation course. Again, depends on your learning style. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, which professional guides are out for COVID and which are the ones planned in the near future? Okay, so so right now at the launch of COVID 2019, basically there were four uh, core publications for COBIT. We have the basically what I call the framework guide. Uh, we have the governance and management objectives guide, uh, the implementation guide, um, and then we have the uh, design guide. And and uh, those are the four that came out originally. So uh, what takes place is we do have what are called focus areas within COBIT. Uh, I do know that ISACA is currently in the process of putting together these focus area guides. Um, think about these, if you're a COVID-5 person, think about these as like the enabler guides we had. So it takes a certain area and dives deeper into that area. Um, uh, to my knowledge, and again, you would have to refer to the ISACA side on this, but to my knowledge right now, none of the focus areas um, have been published yet, uh, but I certainly expect those to be published uh, within the very near future. Uh, cybersecurity, DevOps, uh, risk, and those types of things. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, and there's a couple of qu these questions are very closely related, so uh, combine them somewhat. Uh, COVID okay. 2019 still refers to ITIL v3. Is there a new version expected that aligns to ITIL 4? And then the related <laughs> one is seems this aligns nicely with ITIL uh, 4, yeah, uh, where it's the most yeah. common overlaps. That's always the tough part because you know what's interesting. If you look at the timing of the launching of COVID 2019 and ITIL 4, they were basically launched within a within a, a very tight uh, time frame of each uh, of each other. And and when we went through the process of uh, of looking at the ITIL pieces that uh, specifically linked to COVID, I will tell you this is is 
the modifications in ITIL 4, when we went from, from what we call processes to practices, the links, the references we make in COVID-2019 are not significantly changed, even though COVID, oh, excuse me, ITIL is on ITIL 4. So you can make that mapping yourself. In terms of the mapping, the official mapping, I am not aware or I don't know um, of our efforts right now to update that because you guys know how this goes. As soon as you do an update, uh, let's take NIST or an ISO standard or even ITIL, as soon as COVID links back, then somebody's going to go update those. So that's why this is a continuous process. I don't have a specific date time on that when that will take place, but I can tell you that um, the the references from COVID 2019 to ITIL 4 have not been significantly changed with uh, the adoption of ITIL 4. I will also say that one of the things that I like uh, about that update was ITO4 kind of really focuses on high velocity IT uh, around DevOps, around value chain. And, and those are all things that the COVID practices and activities definitely support. You just have to really look into um, how you want to govern each one of those practices. So I'm not sure I directly answered the question, uh, but hopefully uh, enough information to um, for you to be uh, happy with uh, with my answer on that one. So, okay. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Um, we're, we've reached our hour, so let's finish with one more. Um, you mentioned adapting and adopting COVID. Does that mean I can change the content to suit my enterprise's needs? You absolutely can. The COVID police are not going to show up at your company and arrest you because you're not following COVID exactly the way it says. I can tell you, um, having probably more COVID and ITIL adoptions than most people I know, I have never I have never copied and pasted the COVID or ITIL guidance into my own organization without making some modifications to meet my needs. And that's the whole idea of a framework. You do not have to copy. Now, there are some countries on, in the world who are taking COVID and that has become a standard in which you can't change that, but that's not the intent of a framework. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I think we better start wrapping up there. We've just creeped over our hour, so I hope, uh, hope folks will forgive us for that. Um, so to wrap up, we've got we've got a further slide, haven't we, Mark, with uh, a few links to, to organizations and more information. We'll pop that up while we, uh, while we close. There it is. All right, great. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Of course, this is a slide you want to you want to you want to keep handy because, like I mentioned before, a lot of the things that you'll see out there, APMG International will post uh, out on the website. Asaka will as well. Of course, you see information uh, about me personally. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, as well as uh, with Asaka and APMG. Valuable information out there for each one of you guys. So, thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so that just these uh, just these thank yous, really. So firstly, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, do hope you found it useful and informative today. I'm sure you have. Um, and secondly, thank you, Mark, for your insight and expertise today. It's uh, great to uh, teaming up with you as ever. Um, and last but not least, thank you to our partners at Osaka for their support for, to, for today's webinar too. Um, and what I would also mention, uh, I did mention at the start, but I think we had a few late joiners. There was a few questions about these uh, sharing the slides and the recording. Uh, just to remind everyone, we will be uh, sharing a follow-up email uh, fairly soon once we've got the recording and slides online. So, so we'll definitely make those available to you. Just look out for the follow-up email. Uh, so that's it, folks. Thanks again, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and the weekend ahead. And we hope to see you on future future webinars. Bye bye.